Tonight, breaking news, the deadly flood disaster in Kentucky, the death toll climbing, torrential downpours sparking catastrophic flash floods and mudslides in the eastern part of the state, streets turning into rivers, the water rushing into homes, residents stranded on roofs, others clinging to trees, multiple people killed, the governor joining top story, telling me he expects that death toll to rise to double digits, asking the country to pray for Kentucky, and another dangerous storm taking aim. Maggie Vespa from the flood zone tonight. Also breaking China's threat to President Biden amid escalating tensions with Taiwan. Xi Jinping warning that, quote, those who play with fire will perish by it. How the White House is responding to those harsh words tonight. The president also battling recession fears at home. New data showing the economy shrinking for a second straight quarter. A clear sign the U.S. is on the road to a recession or already in one. Developing late today, the firefighter trap a burning building collapsing as a Detroit battalion fought those flames, how they pulled together to rescue one of their own. Plus, the former president hosting a tournament for the controversial Saudi-backed golf league at his New Jersey country club. The shocking comments he made about 9-11 as families of the victims protest the event. And good evening. It has already been a summer of severe weather, unlike any in recent memory. And tonight, Kentucky is the new target. Hit with one of the most devastating flood disasters in its history. Hours of torrential rain triggering flash floods in the dead of night. Many trapped in their home as the water came pouring in. Daylight illuminating the full scope of the damage. You see it right here. The entire town of Hinman underwater. Homes and businesses flooded up to their roofs. The streets of downtown Whitesburg, still a river of rushing water late this afternoon. Rescue teams working by boat and by helicopter to reach the stranded. The governor telling Top Story moments ago he expects the death toll to climb into the double digits. That interview in just a few moments. The floods triggered by that same system that tore through St. Louis last week. That city hit again tonight. The flood waters rising in all too familiar scene. But we begin our coverage in Kentucky with Maggie Vespa, who's in the storm zone tonight. In a swath of the south submerged, total devastation and a death toll expected to climb. So we got so much road damage. Bridges are gone. The whole roadway is gone. Go ahead. The city of Hazard, Kentucky, devastated after torrential rain spurred sweeping flash floods and mudslides. Well, you know, everybody knows everybody around here. Everybody tries to help, but when this comes comes this fast, it's this ain't nothing you can do. Officials confirming dire numbers. At least eight people killed, including an 81-year-old woman. The governor declaring a state of emergency. We probably have not seen the worst of it. Sadly, we believe that we will uh, lose Kentuckians. And a lot of Kentuckians will probably lose most of, of what they have. Recovery efforts complicated by the storm's strength, knocking out power to more than 25,000 people and wiping cell coverage throughout the region. In nearby Pound, Virginia, rescuers scour an assisted living facility for the stranded. Damage like this gives you an idea of just how strong and fast these floodwaters were moving. This is just a roof ripped off and tossed on the side. There's a power pole over here, literally snapped in half. And then look at all of this. This is just debris on the side of the road. I mean, it looks like a tornado hit. The sinister system wreaking havoc. Repeated rounds of showers and storms pelting eastern Kentucky overnight, dumping rain onto ground already saturated from recent rainfall. The same type of storm that walloped St. Louis earlier this week. Oh my gosh. FEMA and the National Guard are on the ground in Kentucky. Judy Butler's home flooding for the second time this year. Round one back in March. The first time we had insurance, this time we don't, but We'll make it. We always do with God's help. All right, Maggie Vespa joins us now from the epicenter of that flooding there in Hazard, Kentucky. And Maggie, I understand that destruction we see behind you was actually a church at one point. Yeah, Tom, it's crazy to think about. So the church was here on its foundation, but now you just see a hole in the ground, right? And then the building, as you can see behind me, is in those trees. Like the flood water just threw it into those trees. It gives you a good idea of just how powerful these floods were and why there is so much damage, Tom. Yeah, we see those cement blocks just behind you. Uh, given that we're getting a clearer look at this damage, does that mean that the flood waters are starting to recede? I know there's a big concern about more flooding. 
Yeah, so they are starting to recede, albeit slowly, because, you know, we were in St. Louis earlier this week, and those receded within hours of kind of the water cresting, and it seemed to happen pretty quickly. Here, it's, it's taking a while, and as you pointed out, people are really scared because there's more rain slated overnight, so a lot of people told us they're praying that this doesn't get even worse. Tom? All right, Maggie Vespa leading us off with that breaking news tonight from Kentucky. Maggie, thank you. And Kentucky's Governor Andy Bashir, who you heard in Maggie's piece there, is calling it one of the worst flooding disasters in the state's history. He joins Top Story tonight from Frankfort, Kentucky. Governor, you said it yourself, this event is devastating. Where do thing, things stand as today draws to a close? Well, it was a tough night. It's an even tougher day, and this disaster is going to continue at least until tomorrow. We're going to have double-digit deaths um, by the end of this. We're already over eight. Uh, we've already airlifted between 20 and 30 people out of harm's way, but many others on their roofs are even hanging in a, in a tree. So many we can't get to because the water hasn't even crested, and um, it, it ultimately is moving too fast to safely get there. We've evacuated uh, a nursing home. We are doing rescues at a school, though there are not any children in it, uh, thank God. So we're supposed to get two more inches tonight. It's only going to make a difficult situation worse. Can't imagine what that's going to be like for the folks in your state. Talk to me about the moment you realized, or maybe the image that you saw when you realized your state was in some serious trouble. Well, I've been at the Emergency Operations Center um, until from early this morning. Really got the call about 4.45 about how bad this uh, was and, and was there shortly after. You, you get reports in uh, about loss of life, about uh, how high the water has gotten, uh, local officials sending you uh, photographs. It, this one is, is tough. And, and listen, Eastern Kentucky floods a lot but never like this. When you have folks that have been on the ground doing rescues for decades, and they say they've never seen anything like it, and they can't get to people, and they're the most experienced folks out there doing it, you know what we're dealing with is, if not unprecedented, close to unprecedented. And, you and know, Governor, we, explain we, that. What, what, what has been the biggest difficulty in trying to reach those people that are trapped? Well, our roadways are washed out. Uh, some of the current in, in the water is so strong that our fish and wildlife boats can't get there. That's why we have Zodiac boats being brought in by the National Guard and some of our cities sending some of their higher end boats uh, as well. So many people stranded uh, that uh, not enough aircraft with the hoists to, to get to them, but thankfully uh, getting more. This has just hit so many counties, so many people, and it's so big, uh, it's, it's left uh, half of one county almost underwater or struggling. Have you been able to, to speak personally with the president yet? Uh, I've talked to the White House, and, and they reached out proactively. Um, I've spoken to the administrator of FEMA. Listen, we're getting as much communication from, from the White House as we need. I'm pleased at their response. FEMA will be on the ground uh, tonight. So we are getting the support uh, from the federal government. And then finally, what, what do you have to say to the rest of the country who's watching this, who, who wants to help the people of Kentucky? Now, listen, we are good people. And the areas that have been hit have been hit hard. Number one, we need your prayers because this is an ongoing uh, disaster. Number two, these families are going to need your help and your support, not just today, tomorrow, and the next day, which will be the emergency, or, or the next two months, which will be intermediate housing and having enough clothes and school supplies for these kids. But this is going to take a year or more to rebuild. It's that big, and they're going to need your support through all that, too. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir, we appreciate your time during this very, very tough time for your state. As we mentioned, the area is bracing for more rain with flood watches in effect there and in West Virginia as well. Plus, St. Louis hit with another round of flooding, as we said earlier. Let's get right to meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Michelle, walk us through what's happening there. Hey there, Tom. And we're seeing heavy rain continuing to fall. And we're going to see this over the next few days into the weekend. And just to put, it, put this in perspective, we had two historical rain events in less than a week. And just to, statistically speaking, we're seeing one in 1,000 chances for both events in a given year. So this is historical, and it's groundbreaking, and it's becoming more normal. So taking a look at radar, we're seeing really heavy rain falling. 
where you see the brighter colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellow, that's where we're seeing those heavy downpours. Also a little more difficult to see, but in Tennessee, also North Carolina, you see that little orange box. That is a severe thunderstorm warning. So we're going to add that to the mix as we go throughout the overnight hours, and we're going to see severe weather as well. This is what we're expecting in terms of rainfall, locally six inches or higher. So we're going to add to saturated grounds. We're going to see continuing flooding, could see continuing flash flooding as well. The flood threat does continue. We're looking at a flood watch that is in your green for portions of West Virginia, also Kentucky. That includes Eastern Kentucky once again, Western Virginia, and portions of uh, Tennessee. And we're also looking at a flash flood warning in St. Louis. As you mentioned, we had that complex of storms come through. It sort of renewed that flash flooding. So we're concerned about that as we go throughout the next couple of hours as well. Our flash flood risk through tomorrow, where you see the pink, that is the likeliest spot. So it's the same spots, Charleston, West Virginia, Beckley, West Virginia, also Hazard. Hazard saw nine inches of rain in less than 12 hours. St. Louis saw nine inches in 15 hours. So a tremendous amount of water. It's like a sponge that's really wet and it squeezes out that water. So Tom, we'll end it here with a severe threat as well, 9 million at risk tomorrow. Okay, and I know we're going to be staying tracking it all week. Michelle, we thank you yeah. for that. Now to another major headline, this one made by former President Trump. His New Jersey golf club hosting that tournament by a Saudi-backed golf league, sparking protest over the Saudi government's alleged ties to 9-11 hijackers and the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. But the former president adding fuel to the fire with comments he made to reporters. Gabe Gutierrez was there. At his golf club at Bedminster, New Jersey, today former President Trump, along with other celebrities, teed off in the Pro-Am for this weekend's controversial tournament. The Saudi-funded Live Golf Invitational Series had already plucked some of the biggest names in golf from the PGA Tour. Now it's sparking new outrage. This golf tournament is taking place 50 miles from ground zero. It's disgusting. Families of those killed on 9-11 are out with this new ad. They say the tournament is insulting since 15 of the 9-11 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia and that government has a long history of human rights abuses. Terry Strata lost her husband Tom in the attacks. The kingdom is throwing billions of dollars into a PR stunt. They are just want to whitewash away the history that they have with the 9-11 community. Today, former President Trump said he's been friends with Saudi Arabia for a long time. And when asked about the families who are protesting the tournament. Nobody's gotten to the bottom of 9-11, unfortunately, and they should have. When you heard that, what went through your head? Well, he sounds like a fool. The controversy comes after President Biden drew international outrage by traveling to Saudi Arabia greeting with a fist bump the Saudi leader that U.S. intelligence says ordered the torture and killing of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. The Saudi government has long denied it was involved in either Khashoggi's murder or 9-11. Live Gulf tells NBC News these families have our deepest sympathy. While some may not agree, we believe golf is a force for good around the world. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Bedminster, New Jersey. President Trump talked to a handful of reporters there today. What else did he have to say besides those comments about 9-11? Well, Tom, President, former President Trump used the opportunity to bash the PGA. As you know, Tom, the PGA of America backed out of hosting the PGA Championship here in 2022, and instead moving it to Oklahoma after the January 6th uh, riot. President Trump uh, clearly responding to that today, saying that a lot of players he thought weren't happy with the PGA and said they'd get a big payout from playing in this series, which, of course, has drawn international outrage. Tom? Okay, Gabe Gutierrez first from New Jersey. Now to the current White House. Today, China's President Xi Jinping warning President Biden about relations with Taiwan during their two-hour phone call. Meanwhile, President Biden is trying to calm recession fears as the country is hit with more bad economic news. NBC's Kristen Welker has more. Tonight, inside the White House, President Biden under growing pressure after another grim economic headline, the economy shrinking for two straight quarters. We're not in a recession. It's another credibility test for the president on the economy after he declared a year ago that inflation would be temporary. Most of the price increases we've seen are, were expected and are expected to be temporary. Why should Americans take his word for it now when the president got it wrong on the economy a year ago? When we talk about recession uh, in our history, uh, you see that the thing that happens during a pre-recession is, the, the, is that you lose jobs. And we're not seeing that currently. 
And now a new poll shows growing dissatisfaction within the president's own party. 75 percent of Democrats saying they want someone besides President Biden to be the Democratic nominee in 2024. And new NBC News reporting shows the White House is closely tracking the political activity of at least half a dozen Democrats seen as potential 2024 competitors, according to interviews with more than two dozen current and former White House officials, including a charm offensive with those who might be getting too ambitious, hosting Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker and California Governor Gavin Newsom at separate events. Meanwhile, it comes as the president is facing growing tensions with China. Today, he spoke with President Xi for two and a half hours amid a controversial potential trip to Taiwan by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. China opposes Taiwan's independence. According to the Chinese, Xi told Mr. Biden, those who play with fire will perish by it. All right, Kristen Welker joins me now from the White House. Kristen, this is a major international headline. Those words put out there by the Chinese are very provocative. Has the White House confirmed that's what was said? They haven't yet, Tom. We pressed the White House over and over again, but they just would not confirm whether President Xi made those comments to President Biden. The White House did say the two leaders had a direct and honest conversation about Taiwan. The president also reaffirmed, according to the White House, that U.S. policy toward China has not changed. The U.S. recognizes China as the sole government. And late tonight, we're learning House Speaker Pelosi is traveling to Asia this weekend, but it's still unclear whether she plans to make a stop in Taiwan, Tom. All right, Chris, let's turn to politics now. I do want to go back to that piece of NBC News reporting that we saw there in your report. Uh, is, is the White House afraid that, that President Joe Biden may possibly get primaried, essentially Democrats out there who may challenge the president in the primaries coming up? Well, they're trying to put on a confident front right now, Tom. The White House basically dismissing any possibility of a primary challenge and saying that seems unlikely. But there are a number of Democrats who appear to be laying the groundwork for 2024 just in case, just in case. President Biden decides not to run, so much so that Governor Gavin Newsom felt the need to tell Chief of Staff Ron Klain that he isn't planning to run when he made that visit here to the White House, Tom. Okay, Kristen Welker with a lot of new reporting tonight for us. Kristen, thank you. As Kristen mentioned, new data shows the U.S. economy shrank for the second quarter in a row. So what contributed to that decline? Here's Emily Aketa. Today's numbers confirm it. The U.S. economy is slowing. Two back-to-back -back negative quarters, it, it's not good. Gross domestic product fell slightly by 0.9 percent. The U.S. economy shrinking for the second quarter in a row, fueling fears of a recession. Fears President Biden tried to calm. We've created 9 million new jobs so far just since he became president. Business are investing in America at record rates. That doesn't sound like a recession to me. Slowdowns in both the housing market and consumer spending contributed to the decline, but are also part of the Federal Reserve's goal to lessen demand by raising interest rates, all in an effort to bring inflation down from 40-year highs in a complex economy. This is a very unusual situation in that um, coming out of the pandemic, we have a, a set of supply chain challenges that continue to affect the economy. That reality is being felt firsthand far from Washington in Pella, Iowa. This particular chipper is missing this one part. Mark Core helps run agricultural and industrial equipment maker Vermeer. The company is a driver of the economy, but ongoing supply chain problems and labor shortages mean Vermeer can't drive as fast as it would like. There may be a thousand parts in a machine, but it needs all thousand. So missing one part means you don't generate revenue as an organization. It doesn't fit into the GDP number. That's despite the once in a generation high demand the company is seeing for its products crafted by its 4,000 employees. But we need more. We need hundreds more to be able to keep up, you know, with demand. In Pella's nearby town square, a reminder from this mother of three, the economic picture is always personal. You want to be able to work, provide for your family, but you can't afford to work either because you can't afford daycare. And then with prices going up, it's, you know, paycheck to paycheck. Just look at all of this inventory behind me. All of it already sold by Vermeer, but can't get to the customers because of labor and supply chain roadblocks. So you can see the contradiction. There's really strong demand, but challenges in meeting it. Tom. 
Emily Aketa for us tonight. We thank Emily for that report, of course. As she mentioned, businesses and consumers alike are struggling with the impact of labor and supply chain issues, which drove up inflation. And with positive economic signs like job growth up against a shrinking GDP, it paints a confusing picture about the state of the American economy. I want to bring in Andrew Ross Sorkin. He's the co-anchor of Squawk Box on CNBC, a New York Times columnist, and of course, the author of Too Big to Fail. Andrew, first off, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. You know, the economy Tom is Pink. based in Man. numbers, right? And, and you think it's absolute. And yet this feels right now like a mystery. You have the president and Janet Yellen saying we're not in a recession. And yet if you look at, at, at economic history books, right, textbooks, they'll tell you two consecutive quarters of contraction, that's a recession. So explain it to our viewers as simply as possible. Okay, so this, is, this truly is an unusual situation because it looks like a recession from the outside, except for the part when you look at unemployment in this country. And it's very rare where you have two quarters of back-to-back of -back, uh, negative uh, quarters, effectively, for growth, and yet you have unemployment at these remarkably low numbers. So in many ways, it doesn't feel like the kind of recession that we've had in, in years past. And so when you hear politicians say, this isn't a recession, or it's not a classic recession, or we shouldn't be using that definition, a little bit of this is politics, but it's also true insofar as it isn't really the same kind of recession as uh, your father's recession. So, Andrew, you know, we've had two days of Wall Street with the markets up. And I always like to remind our viewers that, that the markets tend to predict the future, right? Yep. They don't really predict, predict this moment in time right now. What, what can we pull from that data, if anything? So what's so unusual about what's happened even in the last 24 to 48 hours is we've gotten these new numbers that suggest a recession is upon us, and yet the stock market's gone up. And people say, how is this possible? Well, the truth is that the Federal Reserve, by raising interest rates and trying to make things more expensive, are trying to tamp down demand. That is actually creating a negative uh, period of growth in this economy. But that's actually what they were trying to do. Now, interestingly, things have not uh, gone down in terms of uh, the growth in the, in the economy as much as some people had feared, or that things actually weren't going to keep going up, 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 up. So the Fed may not have to put the brakes on as much as some people had expected come this fall. And that's why you're starting to see the stock market, at least for this moment, and it really is only a moment, go up. So, Andrew, I do want to ask you, because, you, you know, you wrote the book on the 2008 recession. Um, there were a lot of different factors and a much different story. But I, I wonder, because here on Top Story, we cover the economy a lot, and we always have yep. these headlines. And I call them tea leaves, right? But there are also other headlines we don't cover, like Germans paying way too much for energy, the grain crisis out of Ukraine. I, I just wonder if, if there's going to be a day where there's a headline where we're starting to talk about a world that is like 2008 again. Or do you think we're nowhere near there? I don't think that we're near there. Um, I don't think we're going to have a cataclysmic style um, financial crisis like we saw in 2008. Having said that, I think it's very possible, unfortunately, that it could be a very bumpy year, two, potentially three years. And there's going to be a question about how fast we can grow. We've been living, or at least up until even through the pandemic economically, was almost a sort of Alice in Wonderland situation, almost better than it should have been in many ways. And so there's going to be some kind of pain on the other side. And I think that's what we're seeing. The question is if that's something that's prolonged or if that's something that, that shifts very, very quickly. And for that, um, well, I'd have a different job if I knew the answer. There you go. Andrew Ross Sorkin, we always uh, love having you on Top Story, so we appreciate it. We want to turn now to Capitol Hill. The Senate is getting closer to pushing through a slimmed-down Democratic-backed bill, addressing issues like runaway inflation and climate change, with, with holdout Democrat Joe Manchin saying he struck a deal with party leadership. But as Americans search for relief, what are the chances this bill actually passes? NBC's Ali Vitale has more. After a year of no, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin now explaining how he got to yes on a defining package of legislation for Democrats. I've never reversed and I never walked away. Just two weeks ago, Manchin pumped the brakes on talks, citing soaring inflation. I just said, we got to get this thing down to where it's something that we can live with and we do what we have to do. Democrats and President Biden now rallying around it. Some of you will see a lot of similarities between the beginning of the Build Back Better initiatives, not all of it, but we've moved a long way. 
The bill is smaller in scope and spending than past versions. A price tag once over $3 trillion, now down to roughly $430 billion. With billions in climate investments, prescription drug pricing reform, and tax hikes on the wealthy and corporations. While Democrats say reducing the deficit by an estimated $300 billion. Republicans argue new spending will only make inflation worse. I think it's really bad for America right now as we're trying to climb out of this spiral. Tonight, Democratic senators want to move fast to pass it, but need the whole caucus on board. And Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema still mum on how she'll vote. Right. As we said, she not Have you spoken to Senator Sinema? We'll all be talking and hopefully we'll have 50 votes. And Tom, 50 votes secured also means they need 50 senators in their seats if they want to do this next week. That means no unforeseen absences. And in an environment where a new senator just tested positive for COVID today, that means that there's a real struggle for Democrats to make sure all of their people are here when they actually want to do this. When I talked to, talked to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer tonight, he said he's telling his whole caucus, stay safe. The future of the globe depends on this vote. Tom. Okay, pretty drastic there. Okay, Ali, thank you for that. Still ahead tonight, the couple just detained in Hawaii. Could they really be Russian spies? The false identities authorities say they used for decades and the images of the two in KGB uniforms. Plus, an aide to former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo killed on a Delaware highway. What authorities say happened moments before his death. And the firefighter trap. Take a look at this video. How a battalion pulled together to save one of their own buried deep in that house. Top story, just getting started. All right, now to a bizarre story out of Hawaii. A couple there accused of stealing the identities of babies who died decades ago. Now questions swirling if they are Russian spies after old photos resurfaced showing the pair wearing what looked like KGB uniforms. NBC Stephen Romo breaks down, with, breaks down what we know. Tonight, a married couple accused of stealing the identities of two dead babies decades ago, according to a criminal complaint from the U.S. State Department. The government also submitting photos to the court of the couple in what appear to be KGB uniforms in an effort to deny them bail. Gwen Morrison's attorney says it's not what it may seem. My client wants everyone to know that she is not a spy, that she tried on a uniform that was at a friend's house one time and they took pictures. Uh, and you can tell from the picture that it's the same uniform. Her and her husband are wearing the same uniform and the picture's taken, taken in a home, in their friend's home. We also asked Walter Primrose's attorney if his client was ever a member of the KGB, but he declined to comment. The couple, originally from Texas, are accused of living under false identities for the last 35 years in that complaint filed last week. It may be that these defendants were trying on these uniforms as a goof, but uh, that's going to be up to them essentially to prove because the surrounding circumstances usually reveal whether somebody is truly kidding or if they are dead serious. Neither Morrison nor Walter Primrose have been charged with any espionage-related crimes, but the criminal complaint alleges they have been perpetrating criminal fraud acts. They allegedly moved to Hawaii under the names Bobby Fort and Julie Montague and lived seemingly normal lives, according to their neighbors. She was always friendly. They kind of kept to themselves for the most part. But their home was raided Friday, according to NBC affiliate KHNL's interview with a neighbor. They were arrested for conspiracy to commit an offense against the U.S., aggravated identity theft, and making a false statement in an application and use of passport. There's a lot of FBI members around the house, around the house, and coming into their house, breaking everything. I was uh, noticing prosecutors are asking that they not be granted bail. Is that unusual in this situation? Could that signal there's more to come? This is definitely the kind of case that federal prosecutors will argue that these defendants pose a risk of flight. After all, they're using fake IDs, allegedly. But Morrison's attorney disagrees. Even if the allegations in the complaint are true, that they stole this, these identities 30 years ago, even under these new identities, they committed no crime. And so to hold them without bail or bond is just unreasonable. The criminal complaint also saying Primrose fraudulently enlisted in the U.S. Coast Guard 
and serve for 20 years under his new identity. They do drug interdiction, they do course, uh, coastline protection, and they work hand in hand uh, with the armed forces. He retired and now works for a company contracted by the Department of Defense, according to the complaint. He attended a detention hearing today, according to his attorney. The State Department telling NBC News in a statement that the two suspects are U.S. citizens, but would not go into further details on the case. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now. So, Stephen, I, I got to think that for the family of, of those babies, unfortunately, this has to be so tough to kind of relive that experience. Yeah, something dating back all the way to the 1960s they're having to relive right now. Their family members. We did speak to one of the parents of their babies. The Associated Press actually talked to him, John Montague. He said his daughter, Julie, died when she was just three weeks old back in 1968. And to have all this surface again, he says he's just stunned. He said it was a one in a trillion chance they would find his daughter and use her name for this. And he says people will just stoop to anything these days. Very strange story. All right, Stephen. All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the former Cuomo aide killed on a highway in Delaware. Authorities say 43-year-old Sidney Wolf and his friends were kicked out of a lift while it was stopped in the left lane of the highway. Wolf, who was a senior policy advisor to former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, was then struck by a passing car. So far, no charges have been filed, but that lift driver was fired. Now to the race to save a Michigan firefighter who was trapped after a burning home collapse. Take a look at this, the new aerial footage shows firefighters frantically digging through that rubble in Detroit. The firefighter was trapped under more than a foot of wood, but was eventually lifted to safety. His chief saying he is alert and conscious. Another firefighter was also briefly trapped, but was able to crawl out on his own. Glad they're okay. And a corrections officer in Michigan saved by Narcan after an inmate exposed him to fentanyl. Chilling video from the jail shows the officer slowly falling to the floor and losing consciousness after he came in contact with the substance from an inmate's jumpsuit. Another officer coming in to help administrating an overdose treatment drug. That officer was hospitalized, but is expected to be okay. Okay, now to news rocking the tech world. Facebook's parent company, Meta, reported a decline in revenue for the first time ever. Shares of Meta stock losing about half their value in their first half of this year as the company blames Apple's privacy update for limiting its ability to profit off user data. Bloomberg senior technology reporter Sarah Fryer joins us now. She's also the author of No Filter, the inside story of Instagram. Sarah, you know, for our viewers, I want you to explain how big is Facebook and why is this such a big story? Because I think it's, it's, it, it tells a lot about the broader economy. Facebook has 2.88 billion people around the world using its products every single day. And to just wrap your head around that, it's more than half of the internet-connected population. It's, it's a tremendous amount of people. And so everything that Facebook does is reflective of, of human behavior, and it's also indicative of, of what's happening to us, how we're consuming information, because so many of us are connected there. Now, this revenue miss was, was shocking to investors because this is a company that has been, been bringing forth really easy revenue, it seemed, for years and years. The company went public in 2012, and, and for a decade, that's been unstoppable. But now, things are changing. The economy has changed. The, um, the Apple privacy rules make it harder to collect data on mobile phones. And then you have um, you know, advertisers pulling back their spending. So the company has to do something dramatic. And what so, they have decided so is to do... Apple, Sarah, is Apple really to blame, though, for Facebook's rocky performance? I mean, is this a lot on Apple? A lot of it is. $10 billion in revenue this year can be lost, uh, Facebook says, due to these changes in privacy settings. So, uh, you know, basically what happens on iPhones now is they ask people if they want to allow Facebook to have their data, and you don't have to say yes. A very small proportion of people, in fact, say yes to that prompt. So uh, that is something that, I mean, would you, would you say yes? I, I don't know if I would. I, I think that that has really hurt the ability to target ads efficiently, which means that the ads have become more expensive and, and less effective for everyday advertisers, which Facebook argues includes small businesses, um, people who, who rely on the company to be able to promote their products, on Instagram and on the main social network. Okay, fine, just real quick here. Zuckerberg had shifted his strategy to get into the metaverse, create the metaverse, right? Uh, what, what, what's happening now? Because it seems like he has to kind of refocus his attention on his current business. 
Well, you can't make the metaverse, this virtual reality world, unless you have a strong revenue engine supporting all of that investment. And Facebook and Instagram are going through a dramatic change right now, trying to become more like TikTok, more of a place where content is suggested to you, recommended to you. And that's caused a lot of user backlash. That's caused a lot of tumult with advertisers. So they have a really rocky period to get through before they are able to deliver on that ultimate vision. Okay, Sarah Fryer from Bloomberg, we do thank you for your time. We want to turn out to Top Stories Global Watch. We begin with the raging gang violence in Port-au-Prince. The United Nations says a gang war in just one neighborhood left nearly 500 people dead, hurt or missing over an 11-day period this month. An estimated 3,000 people have fled their home, including hundreds of unaccompanied children. Nicaragua's opposition leader has been sentenced to 10 years in prison. Yurang Suazo was arrested earlier this year for participating in protest against President Daniel Ortega in 2018. He was sentenced for conspiracy to undermine national integrity and for spreading false news. Okay, we want to turn now to the Americas and the ongoing debate over a multi-billion dollar train project in Mexico. Construction for the railway system meant to attract tourists to the Cancun area is starting up again despite growing backlash from activists. NBC's Gotti Schwartz explains. Tonight, deep in the Mexican jungle that blankets the Yucatan Peninsula, uproar as a controversial project known as the Mayan train is set to continue construction. A multi-billion dollar effort that many worry could threaten a region best known for its archaeological wonders and breathtaking cenotes. Popular swimming watering holes tucked near the Tulum Hills. Considered a sacred place for Mayans, now carved with the dirt roads that will give way to the new railway expected to connect to bring millions of tourists, but locals worry they'll end up on the wrong side of the tracks. Ellos quieren que se nos quite nuestra tierra. Ellos dan ese dinero para que hagan estas obras. The train set to cover 950 miles across five states, making stops in some of the most popular tourist destinations. It's been one of the flagship infrastructure projects for President Andrés Manuel López Obrador and now one of his top priorities. With only two years remaining in his term, Obrador is racing to finish construction despite a ballooning budget that has nearly doubled from 10 to 20 billion dollars. Provocará un daño irreversible a especies que están en peligro, en peligro de extinción. But the biggest outcry has come from conservationists and environmental activists who worry the train is being built on top of fragile, intricate passageways. Y desde arriba se ve un suelo firme, se ve un suelo, una selva saludable con árboles que está muy sólida, pero realmente, como podéis ver, pues es una zona hueca. Partners at Telemundo traveled to the region meeting with activists who say you can already see the damage. Branches and dirt now covering the entrance of newly discovered ancient caves that critics say are now in danger. Que se ha destruido de esta manera, no? But despite outspoken opposition and endless delays, the president insists the project is on track to be completed by December of next year. Okay, Gotti joins us now live from Los Angeles. So, Gotti, December of next year seems like a pretty tight deadline. Can they realistically finish the train by then? Yeah, Tom, that's still a huge question mark. Just to give you an example of the uncertainty here, one of the biggest companies behind its construction just pulled out in part because of legal injunctions that are being filed because of that. All the while, critics keep saying this is moving way too fast and environmental and archaeological impact studies have not yet thoroughly been done. Well, Gotti, well, on that point, have they been finding a lot of artifacts? Yeah, not only artifacts, they are literally unearthing things like ancient Mayan temples and human remains as that construction continues. And in the past, in some of those pristine cave systems along the coasts, archaeologists have discovered human remains. In fact, the remains of one woman uh, have dated back to 13,000 years ago, which is the oldest human remains that have been found in the Americas. Uh, but the president insists that work should continue, and he has cleared the way so far, invoking the interest of national security. Tom? The past and the future at war right there. Okay, Gotti, thank you for that. Coming up next, the streaming surge. The major milestone, more people choosing, over, choosing streaming over other services, including traditional TV, than ever before. What's fueling that trend and will it last? We'll break it down.
happening. Nielsen now estimates that streaming makes up for one third of television consumption in the U.S. So who better to help us understand this than Sarah Fisher? She writes Axios's media trends. Sarah, thanks so much for joining Top Story again tonight. So Nielsen just started measuring this in June of 2021. That's actually big news right there. But streaming has now passed broadcast by about 11 percent. Explain to our viewers why that's so significant. Well, it's significant, Tom, because it completely changes the way that we're going to get news, information, sports, and entertainment. You know, in the past, you had to be home, sitting in front of your TV set when something came on. You had to maybe record it with a DVD player or a DVR player later on. But now you can watch things at any time that's convenient for you. And that's great for consumers. It's great for choice. But it's also really great for people like me and you that are in the media industry because it allows us to meet our consumers wherever they are. So, Sarah, this is a little inside baseball, but I do I want to ask you this. Nielsen used to be able to do surveys, and that's how they would determine ratings. How is it going to work in the world of streaming where most of the information is proprietary right now? Well, it was a little bit more in-depth than just surveys. They also had these meters that people would actually punch to show how often they watch something. What's great about streaming, though, is that it actually is a much more precise kind of measurement in terms of how you're understanding what people are watching. Not to get too technical, but Nielsen has partnerships with streaming TV companies like Vizio, for example, and they can actually measure what you're watching through your set-top box or through your smart TV in real time. So you're not relying on human error or, you know, oh, I pressed the button or I didn't press the button, or I filled out the survey a week after I watched something. So it's actually a lot more precise. But to your point, huge deal that Nielsen is measuring this, right? Nielsen forever just measured regular TV, traditional TV. And the fact that they're investing now to measure streaming, as well as a lot of other companies out there, just kind of shows you how important streaming has become to the television industry. So, Sarah, I do want to ask you, you know, Nielsen has shown that Netflix is still the most dominant streamer out there, but they've lost subscribers for, I believe, two quarters in a row. What what happens? Does another streaming platform like the many that you see behind me catch up to Netflix or does Netflix, do you think, stay the dominant in, the, in this uh, business? Well, that's the big question here. Netflix has had a really long lead for so many years, but now that competition is ramping up, you can tell that they're starting to take more consideration about it. You know, they ramped up content spend, but now because of macroeconomic factors, they're starting to temper that a little bit. But they ramped it up a lot because they saw that a lot of the TV companies that they were partnering with, not only were they building their own streaming services, Tom, you know, think about Peacock, think about NBC News Now, but they were taking their content off of Netflix. And so that forced Netflix to create a lot of its own originals. And so for me, I think that Netflix definitely still has a clear lead in terms of the number of minutes that are watched. But what's going to change is, can Netflix really figure out how to develop its own original content? You showed that Stranger Things clip up at the top. Enough of it to really compete meaningfully with companies that have been producing their own content for many years. If they can, I think that Netflix can still maintain its lead. I mean, they have a first mover's advantage. People already have accounts. But if they can't, I think a lot of the traditional TV companies that are getting into streaming, whether that's Disney or Comcast, NBC Universal, the parent company to NBC News Now, or others, they might start to catch up. So, you know, Sarah, as you can see from the, from the graphic, there are so many streaming services out there. In some cases, it feels like you're paying as much as cable to keep up with them all if you have a bundle or something like that. At what point do you think streamers will start to fall off? And, and, and what I mean by that is it's getting very saturated right now. It's totally saturated in the U.S., which is why you see a lot of these streamers pointing to their growth outside of the country. But in terms of falloff, we actually have data that shows most people are only going to pay around $39 a month. And that might change a little bit with inflation. Now, you know what the prices are like, Tom. For $39 a month, you're only looking at three, maybe four services. So that's where it starts to drop off. I think the new thing to consider is advertising. So Peacock is obviously ad-supported, NBC News Now, you know, ad supported. That matters because the price for an ad-supported tier goes down significantly, which allows people to have access and buy more services. Netflix has said that they plan to introduce an ad-supported tier in early 2023. Disney Plus plans to introduce an ad-supported tier. And then many of the others already do, if you think about, you know, Discovery or HBO is introducing it, too. So the advertising uh, landscape is going to bring a lot more 
uh, options to consumers, they might be able to afford five or six services as opposed to just three or four. A lot of competition out there. Sarah Fisher from Axios. Sarah, we love your reporting. Thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. All right, when we come back, a big update to a story we brought you a few months ago. The Uber driver who helped an influencer when she was stuck at Coachella, how she and thousands of other strangers now help that driver reach his dream and help his daughter. Stay with us. Finally tonight, we want to bring you a big update on a story we first brought you on this broadcast back in May. An influencer helping out an Uber driver who had helped her in a major way. Well, since that story aired, the effort to help that Uber driver and his daughter has snowballed. And now that driver is about to follow his dreams. Earlier this year, Raul Torres drove to Coachella Festival, hoping to make some extra money with rides through the Uber app. I love doing Uber. I love doing Uber and Lyft, and I love helping people out. You know, so that's one thing I like to do. But in reality, yeah, I needed the money back. Raul's daughter, Myra, was undergoing chemotherapy. He needed the cash from Uber to help pay for her treatment. That's when Nashville influencer Becca Moore got in his car. What happened next is something you saw right here on Top Story. What started out as a bad day at Coachella for one social media influencer has turned into a viral sensation. Thanks to the Uber driver that stepped up, his acts of kindness now going viral long after the music stopped. Yeah. Becca got in his car after losing her phone, credit card, and keys. What started out as a one-way Uber trip for Raul turned into a whole day of helping Becca to get back on her feet. All I wanted to do was buy a new phone, but he was like, no, we're going to the police. And he helped me file a police report. Kept me calm by getting Starbucks with me because I was stranded. Helped me manually track down my phone and credit card after the police wouldn't help us. And then we were like, let's go get some marks. Even though he was only paid for one ride, Raul says he didn't hesitate to help. But I was still helping Becca because she needed the help. So I'm not going to put money over helping somebody else. A stranger's kindness, even more powerful when Becca learned Raul's story. While we're eating, he started showing me pictures of his family, which is when I learned that his daughter is currently going through chemo and his dad has terminal cancer. And they're both under Raul's care, which is why he had to Uber drive. Congratulations. Becca then Congratulations. shared Raul's story with her followers on TikTok, asking them to help Raul with his family's bills through a GoFundMe. Raul ended his Uber shift that morning to spend his day helping me, expecting nothing in return. That GoFundMe raising more than $250,000 in the last few months. Okay, so the GoFundMe was awesome because it really meant a lot in the way that it helped me pay for my dad's funeral costs, um, helped me pay my rent. Everything I was backed up on, it took all that out of the way and stuff. With the bills out of the way and with his daughter, Myra, now cancer-free, Raul was spending less time behind the wheel and more time with his family and Becca. Both of our lives are different because now we're family. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now we're family. Now I'm stuck with you guys, yeah. Raul says he's using the rest of that GoFundMe money to open a taqueria in Ensenada, Mexico. One act of kindness to a stranger now helping him fulfill a lifelong dream. Yeah, you, I mean, you're the one that did one small <laughs> act of kindness and then you just don't know. Like, it, it's just a snowball effect. I just hope it, it keeps on going. People yeah. help each other out. That's, that's the main thing. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news now on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.